and uh, welcome. My name is Kathleen Borain, and I serve as the Maryland Insurance Commissioner. I'd like to thank you for joining me and my colleagues at the Maryland Insurance Administration today to hear about the commercial insurance issues that small businesses face in Maryland. Since early 2021, the Maryland Insurance Administration has been holding a series of listening sessions to help us more fully understand the experiences of specific communities relating to insurance. These listening sessions help us to better understand the needs of the market that we regulate, to act as a resource to the policymakers in the legislature and to other state agencies, to inform our enforcement of Maryland insurance laws, and importantly, to develop tools, guides, and programs that are useful and helpful to consumers of insurance. Today, our focus is on small business, a crucial economic driver for our great state. Governor Hogan has been a champion of small business, assuring that Maryland is fully open for business, continuously improving the economic climate, empowering the business community to succeed, and opening new pathways to success. The U.S. Small Business Administration's Office of Advocacy defines a small business as an independent company having fewer than 500 employees. Using the latest data from the SBA, According to their latest data, Maryland small businesses employ about 1.2 million people, and small businesses employ about almost 50% of all Maryland workers. Women make up 49.2% of small business employees in the state and own 44.3% of small businesses. Racial minorities make up about 42.5% of small business employees and own about 35.9% of small businesses. Clearly, the health of Maryland's small business sector is not only key to our state's economic success, it is also a critical path to diversity, equity, inclusion, and economic empowerment. Managing risk through insurance is essential for businesses. According to a study by the Hartford, four out of 10 small businesses are likely to experience a property or general liability claim over a 10 year period. And yet, according to the Insurance Information Institute statistic, nearly 40% of businesses have no insurance at all, and about 75% may be underinsured. The pandemic, of course, had a major impact on just about every business, and particularly on small businesses. Cyber incidents continue to rise across our nation and our world, creating more risk for any business that does electronic transactions and changing weather patterns have made severe storms and flooding more prevalent. The Maryland Insurance Administration is aware of these issues. We track them locally and through the NAIC. But today we really wanna hear from you because we really wanna better understand things in a very concrete way. How are you, how are small businesses in Maryland and different geographic regions of Maryland, identifying, managing, and financing your business risk. What are you seeing on the front lines as you operate and seek to ensure your business assets and operations? Are there coverages or resources that are lacking or unaffordable? We're here to listen, to ask questions, and to learn. And as we get started, I'd like to just take a moment to introduce the Maryland Insurance Administration staff that are here today. So first, let me introduce Deputy Insurance Commissioner Greg Durwart, and then Corey Boone, my Chief of Staff. Good afternoon. Joy Hatchett, the Associate Commissioner for Consumer Education and Advocacy. Good afternoon. Robert Barron, the Associate Commissioner for Property and Casualty. Good afternoon, everyone. And you've met Craig I, who is our Director of Communications. Hello and welcome. So just a couple of logistics as we get started. So the listening session is being recorded uh, and is being live streamed on Facebook. We will have our scheduled speakers who I will introduce first. And then afterwards, we will hear from those individuals who registered to speak. If you did not register to speak, but you still want to speak, you, you would like us to hear from you, then as far as time and technology allow, we will accommodate that. Let us know that you wanna be heard and you wanna participate by using the chat feature to, to indicate that as we near the end of our prepared um, session. 
to help ensure excellent sound quality throughout the session, I would ask that you please stay on mute unless you're speaking. And we're gonna start our session today by talking to four organizations who have their pulse on the small business community. Our first speaker today is, and I, my notes here, I'm, I'm having a few technical difficulties, so I apologize for the back and forth. Um, but first we're gonna hear from Loretta Waters, who is the vice president of the Insurance Information Institute. Welcome to you, Ms. Waters. Thank you, uh, Insurance Commissioner Borain, and thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, six, uh, we're gonna be putting together a little slide presentation. So uh, whenever the group is ready. That's okay with us at any time. I'm afraid you have it. Okay, look, oh, thank you, right. Joe. Thank you. So um, a little bit about the Insurance Information Institute, uh, also known as the Triple I. We have been uh, in existence since 1960. Uh, being the trusted source of unique data-driven insights on insurance to inform and empower consumers. We serve consumers, both uh, personal as well as businesses, the media, and professionals seeking insurance information. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please, I'm sorry. Uh, when asked what insurance does, most people are likely to say that it provides protection against financial aspects of a premature death, uh, injury, loss of property, loss of earning power, legal liability, or other unexpected expenses. Now, all that is true. However, the insurance industry's contribution to the economy, economy goes much further. You're gonna go further back. Okay. One could point to the millions of people employed in insurance and related activities to the billions of income taxes and premium taxes paid and to extensive charitable works. Insurers are also the financial first responders on the scene of a disaster. We are capital protectors. Insurance allows us to improve infrastructure and businesses. Next slide four, please. There are so many disruptions impacting US and Maryland small businesses, social unrest, as Insurance Commissioner Biden says, cyber, uh, the pandemic, and the latest geopolitical risks. Uh, today, we're going to talk about some of those disruptors. Next slide, please. Looking at the state of the small business insurance market, there are many risks this important sector faces in 2022. Uh, due to the hit that the economy has taken from the pandemic and beyond, business owners have also faced hard market conditions in 2021 and quarter one 2022, labor disruptions and high commodity prices uh, have constrained performance in 2021 and disruptions are likely to continue in 2022. Next slide, please. The cost of commercial multi policies is on the rise. Why? Rising replacement costs for one. It now costs about 20% more to build a commercial building in the United States than it did a year ago. The cost of materials remains high and inflation is further increasing costs all around. Subcontractors prices are up for non-residential work nationwide too. Concrete contractors prices are up 18.8% year over year. In January, roofing contractors were up 13.9% and electrical contractors up 11.4% and plumbing contractors up 9.9%. There are also delays replacing technology equipment. There are supply chain issues and labor shortages. This is constrained premium growth resulting in businesses postponing any capital investments. Next slide, please, number seven. Due to time constraints, that's the next slide, please. Due to time constraints, I have foregone coverage issues and instead will focus on some of the key industry risks. Joe, can you move ahead one? We're one behind her. You just, yeah, key industry risks, is that what it should say on the screen? Yes. Thank okay. you. And, and you want, that's a placeholder. Is that the slide? Or Correct, so you can go to the next slide, please. One more. There you go. Okay, great, thank you. Again, yeah. those risks include labor shortages, supply chain disruptions, cyber, and ongoing concerns over the pandemic. Many small businesses have experienced a recovery following the height of disruptions caused by COVID-19 and remain optimistic about the global economy. 
However, these business risks continue to cause concern. Next slide, please. One line of business that has been particularly hard hit is cyber. This impossibly hard market position is expected to continue through the third quarter of 22, with a silver lining that renewal pricing in the fourth quarter is expected to flatten. And that's not due to a rate decrease, but because insurers will have already experienced a brutal renewal hike in the previous cycle, and will have to put security controls in place to avoid another. In three short years, the increased frequency and severity of global cyber attacks has turned the cyber insurance marketplace on its head. Since 2020, cyber pricing has skyrocketed as carriers have either pulled out of the market entirely or significantly reduced capacity. Police uh, policy limits have been cut and underwriting requirements for security controls have become mandatory. The war in Ukraine and threats from Russian leader Vladimir Putin raises the specter of possible cyber attacks against the US and Western allies. Local Maryland governments, like schools and hospitals, are particularly enticing soft targets, organizations that lack the resources to defend themselves against routine cyber attacks, let alone a lengthy cyber conflict. For those attacking such targets, the, the goal is not necessarily financial reward, but disrupting society at the local level. This can include everything from emergency services, electric power, clean water, waste disposal, and even banking. Next slide, please. 2021 saw a 31% increase in cyber attacks compared to 2020. The fastest growing cyber crime is hitting small businesses. There were on average 270 attacks per company of all sizes in 2021. At least half of all ransomware attacks, the fastest growing type of cyber crime are on small businesses. Next slide, please. COVID-19 and the economic recession and recovery have changed how we live and work with impacts across most insurance product lines. Chip shortages as a result of the pandemic are likely to keep car prices high, which also translates into higher order premiums for those who have cars for business and even more so for those in the trucking or fleet vehicle businesses. Next slide, please. In 2020, there was a significant increase in employment practices liability insurance uh, claims. EPLI claims related to COVID-19 targeted a wide range of employment practices from claims okay, alleging you, employers- You go on ahead, Joe. That's her landing page, but she's speaking probably. Go, sorry, go ahead. I, I was wrong. <laughs> That's okay. I think there's something wrong yeah. there. So, uh, so anyway, the claims are alleging employers failed to take proper steps to reduce health and safety risk for their workplace to claims alleging employers discriminated against employees with COVID-19 concerns. As businesses return to the workplace, they should evaluate their EPLI policies to assess coverage and how they might respond to COVID-19 related EPLI claims. Businesses should also anticipate premiums uh, to increase by 10% due to anticipated high claim frequency and severity due to the COVID-19 pandemic, social movements like Black Lives Matter and Me Too, not to mention LGBTQ plus protections, marijuana legalization and wage and hour violations. In Maryland, businesses with at least 15 employees must guarantee freedom from discrimination against employees based on race, color, national origin, sex, religion, and disability. Employers with 20 or more employees must guarantee freedom from age discrimination, and employers with four or more employees must guarantee freedom from discrimination based on citizenship status. Maryland's employment discrimination regulations also prohibit discrimination based on ancestry, genetic information, marital status, gender identity, and sexual orientation. These additional protections open the door to, for additional employment discrimination lawsuits and a growing number of retaliation lawsuits in which plaintiffs claim that an employer has disciplined them, fired them, or unfairly passed them over for a promotion because of their involvement in a discrimination complaint. Like most states, Maryland is an at-will employment state, meaning that employers can terminate employment at any time and for any reason, but fired employees can still sue for breach of contract if, for example, they have a written contract promising job security. Maryland also recognizes employed, empl employed in contracts such as if an employee handbook states that employees will only be fired for good cause. These laws are in place to protect employees, 
but they also represent a litigation risk for employers. While all business owners will do their best to mitigate these risks through careful management practices, all small business owners can use the additional peace of mind obtained through a comprehensive insurance policy. Next slide, please. Maryland's most common natural disasters include floods, hurricanes, severe storms, winter storms, tornadoes, wildfires, even landslides, power outages, and extreme heat. Maryland has repeatedly had properties suffer from flood. Uh, although Hurricane Isabel was downgraded to a tropical storm, it still did extensive damage to Maryland in 2003. The storm brought winds as high as 83 miles per hour, flooding and storm surges, which destroyed 300 buildings and 20 acres of beach on Baltimore's coast. Downtown Annapolis was mostly underwater due to flooding and the US Naval Academy suffered 116 million in damages to its campus. Altogether, Is Isabel caused 5.5 billion in damage to areas along the East Coast of the United States and killed 51 people. The most damaging storm was Hurricane Irene, which resulted in 151 million in damage. Next slide, please. Insurers are getting rocked by climate disasters. Insurance catastrophe losses are increasing at an alarming rate, nearly 700% since the 1980s. In the 1990s, there was Hurricane Andrew, which cost $46 billion. And then Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria cost over $144 billion combined. Next slide, please. According to NOAA and the Census Bureau, 39% of the U.S. population lives in counties with coastline, 39%. Yet these counties continue to grow, having expanded by nearly 40% in population since 1970. Next slide, please. Climate risk is evolving. Stronger and more frequent natural disasters, for example, are destroying homes and businesses at record-breaking rates. Hurricane Harvey caused $125 billion in economic damage in 2017 and more than $30 billion in insured losses. Hurricane Ida cost the industry $36 billion. According to Verist's 2019 wildfire risk analysis, 4.5 million homes were identified at high or extreme risk of wildfire. In California, there were more than 2 million properties at high to extreme wildfire risk in 2021, the largest number of properties of any U.S. state. You ask about Maryland. Wildfires are a common occurrence in Maryland. In a typical year, the Maryland Forest Service responds to an average of 123 wildfires that burn more than 1,780 acres of forest, brush, and grasses. Fire departments respond to over 5,000 wildfire incidents annually. Next slide, please. Uh, just thought I'd show this. This is the III has its what's called the Resilience Accelerator the goal of which is to demonstrate the power of insurance as a force for resilience by telling the story of how insurance coverage helps governments, businesses, and individuals recover faster and more completely after catastrophes. We have an interactive map that shows areas for hurricanes and flooding, so you can find that on our website, uh, and that's https backslash resilience.triplei.org backslash. Next slide, please. For small businesses in Maryland and throughout the US, 2020 was the most challenging year in history. Despite the coronavirus pandemic, cyber and supply chain issues, despite inflation, which is now at 8.5%, and that's impacting gas and food prices, more small business owners have been resilient, pivoting and adapting their business models to navigate continually changing conditions. Insurance is an important component of your risk assessments and how small businesses in Maryland can endure. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions the group might have. Let me ask if anybody on my team has any questions first. I have a couple. So from a practical standpoint, you know, very, very interesting, very informative, um, very daunting you know, in lots of ways and lots of um, less than happy information about costing trends. So how do small, small businesses, what, what, what's the pathway? 
for a small, small business as it thinks about its risks, how to manage those risks, and most importantly, how to finance those risks. So in a bleak picture for people who are, you know, trying to maintain or trying to start up small businesses, what what what's what do we help them understand about how to take those steps and, and what it is that who they need to couple with, who they need to talk to, how insurance well, can be affordable? Sure, insurance commissioner. Uh, I think that the important thing to start up is what type of a business you have in order to determine what those risks might be. You know, a retail, small retail store might have very different risks from, say, a dry cleaner who might have issues having to do with environmental. Uh, so you need to make sure to protect your business from all the different risks that you can be associated with. Uh, so, it, you know, a good start, not to promote us, but a good start is to go to our website, uh, uh, iii.org. And um, I, I, I actually www.iii.org and um, we have a section on small businesses and can, you can look and see what some of the risks are what some of the um, areas you need to get a particularly small business uh, should get probably start with a business owner's policy uh, and that is kind of a it's like a, a combined menu so to speak of, of all the different things you need liability property damage uh, it also depends on, do you rent your property? Do you own the property? Those are all factors that you're going to look at when developing uh, a financial strategy. If you're starting up a new business, uh, new businesses have a business plan. All businesses do, do but uh, when they first start, you know, you're starting a, a business plan. You want to look at one of those components is insurance. It's, the, it's an, a very important factor. So one question, so someone um, asked in the, um, the chat whether or not the slides would be available, and the, and the answer is yes. Um, well, we all have posted to the MIA's website uh, the video from today, and the, uh, any materials that were provided to us uh, will be uh, downloadable from that site as well. I, I guess another question that I have for you that I think members of our audience may be interested in is there's the, there's the really valuable educational material that you're providing as people begin to think through what their business plan is. Um, when you come down to applying that specifically to your own business, how do you find that trusted advisor? Um, obviously there's word of mouth and people, other people that you know that may have worked with a producer or you know uh, someone who has expertise specifically in insurance and in various business products. The other side of that is people who love to do things digitally. And we, there are lots of digital platforms out there that um, advertise the entire experience from you know, day one through to acquire commercial insurance products solely online. And I'm interested in sort of what your thoughts are you know, for people that are brand new to the business space, people that are maybe more sophisticated, as, folks are trying to think about the best way to actually buy insurance and apply all of the knowledge that's on your site to their individual business and their specific needs. What are some tips that you have for folks about how to, how to get granular? It, there, there are many distribution channels and it really depends on your level of comfort. Some people uh, and, and I don't want to sound, you know, prejudiced, but usually younger people ha are more comfortable, you know, working with apps like Lemonade and, and different types of insurance apps that provide a quick quote. Um, others want to have more face-to-face uh, -face time with an agent so they can ask certain questions. Um, I think it's probably, especially if you're first starting out, and you have all these potential risks, it's you really want to be comfortable with who you're speaking with and making sure you get all the knowledge to make the right decisions. You know, where your, your business is located is going to be a, another factor. So, you know, if your, your business is on a coastal area, it's in Baltimore or Annapolis, let's say, you know, do you have flood insurance? Do you have uh, certain types of coverages that will protect you 
uh, for business interruption or contingent bus business interruption. If you have supply chain issues that you need to be aware of. So there's so many different factors you need to be aware of and really getting somebody that, that um, you can feel confident will give you the right information to make the right decisions. Uh, it's also good if you are familiar with people in the same line of business that you're in and can get some recommendations from them. Um, you certainly want to get an insurance company that is rated A or better, uh, A minus or better. Uh, it's because you want to make sure that that insurance organization is going to be around uh, if, if you have a loss. So you want someone who's financially secure uh, and has brings knowledge to you. And if you don't understand something that your agent or broker is bringing to you, you really need to ask those questions again to get the right answers. And if you feel uncomfortable, find a different person to ask those questions to because, you know, knowledge is power. Thank you. Very, very sound um, advice. And um, I really appreciate the time. I appreciate the slides. Um, your website, I know, is a really terrific uh, resource, and I encourage folks who are small business owners to access it because I think you will you will learn a lot, and it will empower you when you're working with uh, professionals uh, because you will go into those conversations having a really good idea of granular questions to ask. So thank you. Anybody from the MIA have any follow-up questions? Well, thank you again very much for um, visiting with us today and, and uh, providing us with, with really that, that, that level set information. So thank you. Thank you, Insurance so Commissioner Brian. So we're now gonna move to uh, Mary Kane, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Maryland Chamber of Commerce. Ms. Kane, we are delighted uh, to have you here today. I know you have recently ascended to this position and uh, we're excited uh, that you're able to, to join us and share with us your thoughts about the, uh, the small business community and, and the, the challenges that it's facing in financing risk. Okay, well, thank you very much, Kathleen. Thank you for the invitation. Um, this is wonderful. And Loretta, thank you so much for your insurance words of wisdom because I do know that your website and everything that you do is very critical, especially to small businesses. And of course, I am delighted to join you here today to discuss everyone's favorite topic, business insurance. And this past Monday, we concluded another legislative session in Annapolis. And it's always interesting to watch how the predictions at the beginning of the session drastically change as the 90 days wears on. We did think that it would be a relatively quiet session since we were gearing up for an election this year. But that thought quickly evaporated when climate change, cannabis, and family and medical leave insurance legislation became front and center for our General, General Assembly. And then on top of this, we have a very volatile national landscape to contend with, supply chain issues, gas prices, and a war in Ukraine. And you might say, what does that have to do with insurance? Well, we'll get to that in a bit. One thing I wanna say is thank you to Chris Erdman of RCMND for taking the time to answer all my questions because this was kind of a very much a um, quick study on all of these business insurance questions um, since we were really dealing with a lot of legislation. And Loretta, you covered a lot of the things that um, Chris was giving me some information about. But one thing is SB 275, which passed this session, and it is entitled the Family and Medical Leave Insurance Program. And I don't know if it's an insurance program, but it is a payroll tax that has been implemented in nine other jurisdictions around the country. Uh, the Department of Labor is charged with developing and administering this program. We do not know what the employee's cost will be, nor the cost to the employer. They'll start collecting funds, which will come right out of your paycheck in 2023, but you will not be able to obtain support until 2025. I know I sound very cynical because we did oppose this because it is very um, 
random and not very well laid out. And there have been a lot of issues with the other programs around the country. So we can also talk about other business insurance since I, I really can't explain what's gonna happen with the family leave legislation. Apparently about 200 people need to be hired over at the Department of Labor to get this thing, this program up and going. You will not have a choice on whether or not you um, contribute. So I, I usually choose to buy insurance, but otherwise. But on the whole, while the hard market is not over, there are concerns. There does seem to be a little bit of relief on the horizon. Um, rate hikes were across the board in 2021, and they've been less severe as we move into 2022. I know in primary casualty lines, inflation and litigation financing, that drives the cost to move uh, cost upwards. Workers' comp seems to be relatively stable for insurers right now, and commercial auto rates continue to rise due to technology costs and large jury awards. Umbrella or excessive liability, they continue to see large increases in the early stages of 2022, depending on your risk profile. And Loretta, thank you. You have on your website, you have the ability to kind of figure out what your risk profile is. Um, high risks may continue to see increases of up to 25%. Lower risk profiles may see a flattening of rates as we roll through 2022. Now, commercial property programs will be reviewed to ensure sufficient coverage and the need to validate valuations. Renewal outcomes will vary widely on the quality of the risk. And valuations of property will be key. Supply chain issues and labor shortages will greatly affect the cost to replace property. Cyber and communicable disease exclusions are now the norm. So let's talk about DNO insurance, okay? It will continue to be impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The Biden administration is expected to increase regulatory oversight, thus impacting your DNO lines. Event-driven actions, um, lawsuits from social movements such as Me Too, will also be watched very closely. The fiduciary market will be affected by unpredictable litigation trends. Okay, let's take uh, Hughes versus Northwestern University. This is a Supreme Court case where the plaintiffs claim that the university breached its fiduciary responsibility by failing to choose a cheaper institutional share classes instead of retail share classes, retaining two different record keepers who charged excessive record keeping fees and including too many investment options that caused confusion. A lower court dismissed this case. The Supreme Court reversed this decision and directed the US Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit to reconsider the case. This court found that a fiduciary cannot just select a range of investment options without evaluating them regularly and individually. They did not address the uh, too many options question. So now we have employment practices liability, which is key for especially small businesses. These lines will continue their trend of unpredictability and rates continue to rise. COVID-19 related lawsuits were on the rise in 2021, and this is expected to continue through 2022 especially now that we're seeing a reinstatement of mask usage in various communities and industries. Return to work pronounce pronouncements will create instances for discrimination, retaliation, harassment, and wrongful termination litigation. Employees are seeking to hold their employers more accountable for societal issues than they did in the past. Me Too and the Black Lives Matter movement are cases in point as more businesses seek to create a hybrid or work from home, wage and hour related claims will also be important. There's um, some interesting takes on this uh, technology company that is in, uh, out in Seattle. Um, everybody sent everybody home for COVID and folks decided to move to like South Dakota and all these other wonderful places. And then this company's like, well, yeah, but we're paying you wages, Seattle wages, not North Dakota wages. It's gonna be very, very interesting to see how that all 
pans out. Um, also, federal and state regulatory compliance issues related to the pandemic will continue to evolve and must be monitored closely. Okay, crime. Crime policies are expected to increase up to 15%, and there are many reasons why, and I think Loretta talked about it a lot, cyber. The FBI estimates that cyber criminals stole more than $28 billion between 2016 and 2020, with the average loss being more than $150,000. You need to focus more on security measures to prevent this. We will continue to see increased deductibles. You will also see how exclusions on cryptocurrency and NFTs will be the norm. One thing we will also see in Maryland is more scrutiny on ties to the cannabis industry. This past session, the General Assembly passed legislation to require a referendum on the legalization of recreational cannabis in Maryland. This will be on the ballot in November, but it's still not legal under federal law. Safety concerns for businesses are in question. It's very difficult to determine if someone is impaired on the job by cannabis. There is an increased effort to find a scientifically sound impairment test, but it's not there yet. Cyber, as Loretta said, remember when I said even more affects insurance rates? Well, here we are. Cyber liability lines saw record high increases in 2021 of up to 34% the first increase of over 30% since 9-11. And these numbers are tied directly to a record increase in victim losses from 2020 to 2021 of 68%. And this is according to the FBI's 2021 IC3 report. These numbers are crazy, but expect them to get worse. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has emboldened Russian cyber gangs to side with the Russian government. And as a business, you need to begin your, re okay, and now looking at your renewal processes, you need to begin this early. Insurers are increasing restrictions and limiting exposures by reducing the size of their portfolios, especially in this area of cyber. We have absolutely no timeline for how this conflict will end or how it will continue. So looking to the future, we have a long road ahead before we near the end of the hard market we are in now. Cyber liability will be closely scrutinized as the top line in distress. And while the war continues, the extreme prices, price increases we are seeing could very well worsen before they get better. So this is the time to really take a look at all of the insurance that you need. As Loretta said, please go on her website. I don't have that kind of stuff on my website. Um, so I am happy to tell my 5,500 members, please go to her website. And, and I just, just want to say thank you very much. And thank you, Kathleen. Absolutely. I'll back and to thank you. you very much as well. And for everybody who's listening and for the uh, small business representatives here, do not go yelling and screaming out of business, right? So yeah, no. It is absolutely the case that we have to look critically and realistically at some of the things that are happening or are happening in our economy that impact the cost of insurance. But the other piece of the story and the reason why it's important to go to the IIII site and to use the kind of resources that you can get through, um, through insurance brokers and insurance producers and you know, business advisors and working with folks that are in the commerce, then in the uh, Maryland Chamber, is to understand that insurance is financing for risk, right? That's what it is. And so we start discussion around what are the risks that exist. So when I engage in this business activity, I have to have a realistic sense of what are the categories of risks that exist. But then the next thing that I have to do is I have to think about how do I mitigate those risks? And there are ways to mitigate, mitigate or in some cases, eliminate risk effectively. And so that's being astute about your business operations and how you operate business. Because as you mitigate and eliminate risk, and when you turn to financing risk through many means, including insurance, then when you go through an underwriting process, you can assure that you are getting the best rates possible. So it's important to think about this as a continuum and to have risk management 
built into your insurance program. Um, and those are uh, tools that uh, brokers and producers and folks that are helping you put that whole package of insurance materials you know, together uh, can help you to work through. So yes, cybersecurity uh, risks are expanding. The cost of cyber insurance is getting broader. There are higher, the, uh, the underwriting criteria are becoming more precise and strict. But that's also a tool, right, that you can use. You can use those underwriting standards because the, what those underwriting standards do is they tell you how to lessen your risk to begin with. That's why they're there. So there's a, there's a, a positive narrative around all this as well, because ultimately you don't want to have the loss that insurance has to finance, right? You don't want to have the loss in the first place. So working cooperatively with your insurance, the insurance community as a risk mitigator and a tool for risk elimination is a very um, powerful thing for your business, particularly when you're working in an environment where you are, frankly, your producer is being paid a commission out of the product and therefore you are able to take advantage of all of those rich underwriting tools um, to help improve your business and your risk profile going into it. So um, thank you very much, uh, Mary, for sharing with us that sort of that overall, and thanks for Riggs Council and Michael Downs. I'm you know, very familiar with the folks over there. It's a great group of people. Um, and I know that you have lots of resources. Let me ask the members of our um, team, Joy, I can see you're off. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, please. Thank you. And so while any, if any of the small business owners that are on the line and what you've heard from Loretta and Mary seem to be a little bit overwhelming and you're thinking, oh no, what do I do? The state and the counties have many, many resources to help you. If you go to the Department of Commerce, they have what they call incubators or other businesses that are just like yours that have gone through and are in the process of going through developing the business plans figuring out how to mitigate and understand what's going on. There are many, many in each county, the SBA has organizations. So don't feel overwhelmed. There's help out there, multiple resources. I would start by going to the Department of Commerce's website and then also the SBA's website and your local jurisdiction and partner with someone that's in a business that's like yours and they can tell you, okay, these are the things that worked and these are the things that didn't work. And so don't get overwhelmed. I mean, you're, it's an exciting to be a business owner and just find those resources that are out there to help you. Really well said, Joy. And, and one of the things that will come out of this session and why these sessions are so valuable is that Joy and Craig and others within our administration are, as we speak, putting together a presentation on cyber insurance where we will be working with professionals who are uh, targeting specifically small businesses to help them be better educated and learn about what is your risk, how to mitigate risk, how to reduce risk, how to go through an underwriting process, what kind of products are out there, what do you really need? So these are the kinds of things that as we hear from you and we hear what the concerns are, we are partnering with the business community, with the regulated community, with other state agencies like commerce and education to put together resources for you. And we wanna hear what kind of additional resources that are, ha uh, that are very helpful to you. And so with that, unless anybody else from the MIA has any additional comments on Mary's presentation. Let's see, so let me introduce Dr. Tamira Lucas, who is the co-founder of Moms as Entrepreneurs. So Dr. Lucas, we are delighted to have you here with us today. And uh, we would like to hear from you 
as uh, someone who works with entrepreneurs all the time and really understands what it means to be on the other side of these conversations that we're having. Um, very interested in hearing your thoughts today. So thank you. Thank you so much for um, having me. I'm actually very excited to be able to have this conversation because it's one, it's a conversation that we typically have a lot with our mothers and our program. Um, and so when I was thinking of a question and I totally get insurance, trust me, um, and the importance of insurance, both business and personal, right? Um, but typically when we are engaging in um, the moms that uh, that are in our program and they actually have a brick and mortar um, space, they always ask the question in regards to the minimum coverage. And so I have a question for you all. There's typically a quote minimum coverage for commercial buildings of about a million dollars. And landlords, they tend to enforce um, this on their tenants, even when the building value may not, may be far below that. And so is there a standard of coverage that can be enforced based on the actual value of the commercial building? So we have on the phone with us today, and he'll come on camera, our Associate Commissioner for Property and Casualty, Robert Barron. And uh, so Robert, I'd like to hear from you and Julie first on that. Yeah, uh, so there is nothing in the in insurance law that that addresses a um, uh, a minimum standard for uh, uh, property insurance. In fact, there's very few in the property casualty lines of business. Very few required coverages at all. Um, of course, for your automobile insurance, you've got required minimum liability limits, um, but um, uh, generally speaking, the answer is no, and there's no um, uh, insurance requirements that address the contractual arrangement between the landlord and uh, uh, a, a tenant. Um, and so landlords can um, negotiate or, or seek to uh, enforce, if you will, or require um, whatever they choose, and the market's going to determine whether they have a you know, a customer for that property or not. Um, but the short answer to your question is there, are, um, property coverage is not mandatory. Um, so um, there's no specific uh, limit. Now, there is a requirement in, when we get away from commercial business into um, residential properties for, for homeowners, for example, your insurer cannot require a higher uh, property coverage limit than the actual replacement cost value of the of the property itself. So, in other words, if you had a four hundred thousand dollar loan on a property that it would only cost two hundred thousand dollars to rebuild, you couldn't require a, a, that higher limit of liability to cover the loan indebtedness amount. It's just the replacement cost value. But on the commercial side, um, there's no um, there's no man there's no insurance requirement that addresses that. I think, Dr. Lucas, what you may see, too, is that Robert's absolutely correct. You're not going to find anything in the insurance article that's going to mandate that. But what you may have is the landlord, particularly if they have a mortgage or, you know, some other requirement on them that may set some of those limits. Otherwise, it may be a negotiation. And I don't know, Robert, that it you, you would see in the commercial space that it's the carrier that's imposing that minimum, you know, limit. I, I would think that that really is driven more by the property owner um, who is the, who's, who's requiring their tenant to have that, that, that be driven by their, by others. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, insurers are generally going to want to write um, a, a property coverage limit at something that approaches the replacement cost value of the property unless for whatever particular reason the um, product that's being purchased is an actual cash value product um, where the hopefully the property owner understands that um, you know and so um, but generally speaking the the uh, uh, when a landlord is requiring an a uh, tenant to uh, 
obtain uh, cover in a certain amount. That's the, that's as Kathleen mentioned, uh, gonna be the subject of negotiation, a contract negotiation between the, uh, the landlord and the uh, prospective tenant. Thank you. Do you guys, from, uh, from your perspective, do you see that as a barrier for small businesses with obtaining something of that value that may not necessarily, you know, like if the building is worth 500000 but you're requiring, you're, that landlord is requiring um, that million dollar policy, do you see that as a, um, you know, as a barrier of entry for small businesses and if so, if not, um, do you see that as a potential of some type of legislation that can happen to kind of mitigate that? Um, I, I would say that, you know, when you use like we'll just use that example you just mentioned of, you know, a $500,000 building and a landlord wanting the tenant to procure a uh, million dollars of, of cover on the building, most insurers are not going to, that would be the, um, what we'd consider a, a morale hazard or what an insurer would consider a morale hazard. So insurers are not going to want to write uh, a million on a $500,000 uh, building. It opens them up to a loss potentially in excess of the actual value. Um, I, uh, it's hard for me to comment on whether that's a barrier or not. Um, I, I think that uh, landlords um, would need to be reasonable in their uh, demands, if you will, contractually to, to, in order to just obtain a tenant. On the liability side of the equation, um, you know, landlords um, frequently want to be named as an additional insured on the tenant's uh, liability policy. And that's generally uh, an easy thing to accomplish. Um, but um, uh, overshoring the over insuring the property would be problematic from uh, our licensees, the insurer's perspective. So, Dr. Lucas, this is Joy Hatchett, and I talk with multiple small business owners as I travel around the state. And what we do see at times are, depending on the market that's in place in the particular area, it may be easier or more difficult for a tenant to find a space. And what we encourage, just like I was mentioning that you work with commerce or you work with one of the other jurisdictions, talking to other landlords and seeing what other opportunities are out there and available and I tell people one of the key things before you sign that lease is to make sure they understand the requirements because sometimes the leases make you responsible, not just for the structure, but for the build out and all of those things. So it's critical that they get to the extent possible. And now I know small businesses don't necessarily have a lot of funds to hire their own attorney, but working with an incubator will help with that so that, okay, so Joy's landlord wants to charge X, but maybe Joe that's just down the street won't charge as much. So really working with the community and the resources to see what's out there and available, I think would help your moms. So Dr. Lucas, I, I agree with that, with what both Robert and Joy have said. What I would suggest is that when, when you have a member of your organization, the moms that you're working with as entrepreneurs, and they encounter what seems to be a disconnect. So, and sometimes what they think of as a disconnect may be because the space that they're renting isn't worth a million dollars, but the landlord is looking at the broader set of buildings or the, the entire area or the whole building or, you know, because if there's a fire in the tenant space, it's going to impact the entire building potentially. But when they observe that, that disconnect, um, they can ask a trusted ally 
if they're working with a broker, um, they can ask, you know, what because they're going to have to procure the insurance. So the first thing they want to do is talk to the insurance agent about, is this rational? What, what's the basis for this? What, what am I actually insuring here? And what is it costing me to insure that? So that that can empower them in a negotiation with the landlord. But if something really seems out of kilter and the broker can't really explain it or the broker has reservations about it, that's when you call us. That's what we're here for. So that's when you call Joy Hatchett's unit or you call Robert Barron's unit. And we act as a resource to help you sort of tease that out. Our consumer education and advocacy unit which Joy oversees that she is the associate commissioner. And actually she's more than the associate commissioner because Joy was there on day one and she has been building that unit for over 20 years. And so Joy is the person who's going to help consumers and consumers of insurance, right? Which include businesses. She's the person with her team working with folks like, like, like Robert and me and others on this call are going to be the ones who can help answer those questions and, and be that trusted resource when you're not able to get information from anywhere else. So please make sure that the, the, the moms that you work with understand that they can come to the CEAU at the MIA anytime for help. Awesome. Thank you. This has been extremely helpful. One of the questions we get a lot from uh, people who are either business owners or looking to, to start a business is, you know, where can they go to um, uh, find insurance and even just figure out what kind of insurance they need. And um, it's often a good idea. You know, most businesses are not off. So there are, um, uh, they have competitors, right? And because there are multiple people in the same business, there's often um, professional groups or associations or trade groups and a lot of times, even people who are competitors but are in the same field, maybe they're not in the same geographic part of the state, are a great resource to talk to, uh, to find out, hey, what agent are you using or what broker are you using? Where are you getting your coverage? Um, what are you finding? Um, you know, are the, are the hurdles? And it's a really useful thing is to talk to peers in the same uh, business space. Dr. Lucas, we're not letting you go because we're... We're here to talk about whatever you need us to talk about, but mostly we're here to listen. And so you've just educated us about an issue that's of concern to the folks that you work with. And, and I'd like to know, putting you on the spot, I know a bit, but I'd like to know, first of all, can you share a little bit more about what your organization does and who your members are? And are there other areas where you all would benefit, your members would benefit from additional assistance? of any sort, whether they're webinars or whether they're kind of town halls or what kinds of things would your folks benefit from? So thank you, you're not, you're not totally putting me on the spot, <laughs> but Moms as Entrepreneurs, which is now actually the National Association for Mom Entrepreneurs, is an organization that provides education, advocacy, and funding for mom entrepreneurs. And we have a very specific focus of moms that are in underserved communities. Uh, we know that it is important for in strategic investments into moms because they are actually the backbones of most communities. Um, none of us would be here without them. And they are the ones that's going to help create generational wealth um, and change the trajectory of where we are in any state, in any city. And so we provide an eight session um, entrepreneurship training program. So we take moms from no matter where they are in business and uh, we take them throughout our, our custom curriculum to help them start or scale their businesses. We are working with um, governments, government agencies to advocate for more resources for mom entrepreneurs because they tend to clump moms into um, the category of women. And while we are women, we are moms that have different needs than a woman that do not have children when we're talking about the risk of starting or scaling a business. And so um, we've been providing this service in Baltimore since 2014. Um, and we're super excited to still be around and still to be, um, be serving our communities. Typically, a mom in our program, again, are moms that are coming from um, underserved 
for communities that tend to be brown and black individuals that not necessarily ever had access or opportunity to start businesses. Um, we actually run two academies. One of the academies is called a Makers Academy in collaboration with OpenWorks. And we, um, those individuals that um, are enrolled in that academy are specific mommy makers. So they're actually making a product um, and, you know, as for their business. And so we um, partner with OpenWorks to provide that training and their resources in order to help grow the economy in Baltimore. Very oh, and, the re and, and what you all can do, I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of that. <laughs> So we would actually love to have you guys come in and talk more about the resources and support that you offer. Um, you know, to be honest, like if I wasn't in a leadership role, I probably would not know about MIA. And so I think it's important to bring you guys actually into the community so that they know that you are available um, you have these resources, you have the support, and they have, you You guys are, are essentially an advocate for them when it comes to, you know, insurance. And so I think it's important because a lot of them don't know about business insurance. They don't know about commercial insurance. And so while we do bring in some resources, I think it would be extremely beneficial to have one of you guys come in to our academy and I'll be reaching out because we have one that's starting next month. <laughs> You just let Joy up like that. I, I see <laughs> Joy popped in and say, you know what, I'm here. <laughs> Dr. Lucas, um, Craig has your contact information and after this call, I'll be reaching out to you. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Joy. <laughs> we, we, would, we would be delighted to help you teach those, those, those things to, pro to provide that, that, that framework. Um, for your academy members, you know, and, and, and really any other group that is you know, doing the kind of work that you're doing. Um, so we will happily partner with you. And out of that, you will help us learn what kind of resources, static resources to have available so that in addition to the interactive work that we can do, um, it, your folks will help us to, to learn what are, what's actually useful, you know, like brochures can be more or less to use, right? But what are the tools actually take with Thank you. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Yeah, I look forward to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody else from the MIA have any questions for Dr. Lucas? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lucas. And we very much look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. And I'm now going to invite Anna Karina Rodriguez, who is here representing the Maryland Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, where she is a member of the board of directors and the chair of special events. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez is also an associate Asian, agent and commercial line specialist at Payne Insurance Associates. So Ms. Rodriguez, I'm particularly um, delighted to welcome you here today uh, in all of your capacities. So. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. All end up um, to the lack of uh, public information and education on insurance. Some examples are outed, failed because of the assumption of the 1099 employees are subcontracted for that role should not be included on their workers' compensation insurance policy, which uh, put the business owners in a very bad situation once becoming liable on a worker's compensation loss or even worse of having a good communication between them and the insurance agents or career about the company's operation to avoid cancellations or big increases or with questions about coverage they need for the correct business classifications. Um, for example, if it's a restaurant having the liquor, the liquor insurance coverage, spoiling 
much rental income replacement, loss of incomes, to name some. I have been talking to um, a lot of uh, small business consultants from the SBDC, uh, SBA, and other nonprofit organizations. And those topics kept coming up. The solutions I think uh, will be uh, to see, um, would like to see our careers should have, the, uh, should have to offer policies documents in Spanish per request, at least in our state for those who are uh, more confident reading those documents in that language. Advertising in Spanish from the Maryland Insurance Administration about this information on his on Hispanic channel that will also help. Those channels are uh, TV channels are full of advertising from insurance agency uh, agents and agencies offering unrealistic rates, but not so much going over information about coverage needs and how they can be, pre be prepared for an audit, um, et cetera. No, the resources are available, but not everyone knows about it. So it will be uh, good to give those small business owners the knowledge they need to be, uh, you know, sort of. That's very helpful. Um, I know that. So we've, we've worked at the MIA on um, enhancing our, uh, the, the translation of our materials into both Spanish and Korean and you know, looking at various languages. And we've built out um, our Spanish language site. Uh, it, it's always helpful to get feedback, particularly. So I may ask you if we can um, call upon you to take a look at that mm -hmm. part of our website and get your honest take on, um, you know, how, how it looks to you, what you think is good about it, what you think is problematic, what you think of our translations, um, okay. and you know, give Joy your thoughts about how we can make it better because we're always trying to improve that. Um, another question that I have for you is that I was recently approached by a member of the General Assembly um, about the um, offering of our producer exams in Spanish. In Spanish. And classes in Spanish. And I've talked to a number of my uh, fellow commissioners in a number of states, um, including, you know, uh, just talked to uh, Commissioner Caride, who is the commissioner in uh, New Jersey, and had conversations with the Delaware commissioner. So looking at some of the adjacent states and you know, how they are addressing this issue. And there are several of our uh, states that have gone that route where they are looking at um, language, uh, making sure that the classes are available in Spanish and making sure that the test is available in Spanish. And I'm, I'm interested in your view about, you know, is that important? Is that something that, you, that the Spanish community, the Hispanic community is looking for? Yeah, that was, um, as, 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 well, my partner, um, he was uh, my business partner. He he told me about that. Um, he he told me like, why you don't bring this question up? And I thought maybe uh, that we have to know the terms in English um, at the time to to take the exam and at the time to help uh, the client with the translation. Uh, I think it will be important to know in English and also in Spanish. Um, my experience was um, different. I have to take my test a few times because I think it was because of the language barrier. And um, I guess I have to study hard to look in the dictionary. It was, it was harder than others who took the, the test in English. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of uh, conflicted on that. I think we need to know the, the term uh, terminology in English, but it will be also helpful for the, for some of the producers who came um, to immigrate to this country as an as adult, like I did. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. That's that is exactly the conversations we've been having back and forth about the accessibility and the ability of folks who are. Um, primarily Spanish speaking and sort of think and analyze things um, in their native language and how do we help them to um, 
connect into the producer community and be resources, et cetera, for other primarily Spanish speaking folks. But when you also have materials and contracts that are written mm -hmm. in English, do you, are you then able to fully advise folks? So that that's yeah, and that also you will have to have the CEE, the CE credits classes in, in Spanish, and you know I think it's important to 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 do it, but also um, to know the the terminology and they can you know read the contracts in English too. I've been across of a lot of um, policies from my clients that. Um, business owners who have uh, been with other insurance producers and they're they're explaining um, in my opinion the the coverage um, interpretation is very very different than why I seen um, but I've been doing this since 2008 so <laughs> that's very very helpful um, are there other areas where you feel that specifically um, the Hispanic community would benefit from additional tools or resources that the insurance administration or other government agencies could provide as, as they think about um, their, their small business insurance needs, whether that is the commercial insurance, which is what we're focused on primarily here today, but access to other forms of insurance as well. Like I, I know that, you know, trying to put together what we talk about sort of wealth accumulation. So things that are not that, that life insurance um, that we don't cover, you know, pension funds, et cetera, but, you know, annuities are often utilized to fund kind of retirement plans, even in small businesses. So how can we, how, what are other resources that small businesses need? Well, I think that the resources um, in, a, in the Hispanic community are limited on that. They, I think it, we need way more education about uh, life insurance, group life insurance, and um, retirement plans. All, um, yes, it's, I think it's, it's very limited, the information that we have. Um, I think it will be helpful um, if uh, if we if we get more resources from the Maryland Insurance Administration that we can distribute uh, with other business owners um, to you know to I try as a producer and we all try but um, it's not like it's not like a commercial insurance or outer insurance that they're looking for it every day I think it will be more helpful to 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 have those uh, resources of education um, to the community. So Ms. Rodriguez, just as we indicated to Dr. Lucas, we are more than happy to, I mean, we've got lots of written materials, but also we do presentations. I already have one bilingual translator on staff and she goes out and does multiple presentations on multiple areas. We have our second bilingual translator that'll be starting in a couple of weeks. Obviously we need to get him trained, but we are more than happy to work with you and other members of the chamber to give presentations so that it's not just the materials that people can read. And we also have videos that are in Spanish, but we're also more than happy to come out and give presentations. Great, thank you. We'll be in contact, I'm yeah, sure. That's great. And, and the more you're able to tell us what kinds of resources are helpful, um, and you know, ask, we'll ask the chamber and you know the the, the insurance community the, and the insurance professionals that serve the Hispanic community to be able to say what are the tools you wish you had, what are the things that you wish you could or you know point to. As, there, as Joy said. We're happy to come out. We're happy to populate. We're happy to talk. We're increasing um, all our um, Spanish collateral and the members of our staff that are able to communicate effectively in other languages, including Spanish. But the more that you can point us to the needs that you have, and, and that that's for us at the MIA, but we also partner with other agencies, right? 
So the information, what we learn in these listening sessions, we also pass on. So, you know, we will be working with our colleagues, for example, at Commerce to talk about, you know, what we learned from today and, and ways that we can partner with them to insert, you know, kind of the insurance component of, uh, you know, the state's resources for small businesses. So uh, we'll be very happy to hear from you on that. Yeah, you, we should well contact you. Like I say, I think that the, the most, like somebody else just say, the knowledge is power is, is, is what it is. And um, I think it's a, like a big gap of um, information that uh, we need to fill our business owners, especially the small ones, the constructions, the contractors, there, there are many, many, many in the area. And um, they're, they're growing, but the, you know, it, it just, it, when the, I sit with them and go over and out it, I see that um, a lot of things I wasn't disclosure the way they supposed to be. So educate um, the community itself um, will be helpful, um, especially on, like I say, it's a big topic on classifications and audits and um, communication with uh, the insurance uh, company and the brokers um, is, 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 is very, very important. No, that is very, very helpful. Um, and I will look forward to continuing the conversation. Um, and you have the contact information and she has your contact information. And so let's continue the conversation. Okay. Is there anybody else at the MIA that has any additional comments or questions for Ms. Rodriguez? Okay. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I look forward to the, on the ongoing dialogue. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So we are very appreciative of the individuals who were so kind and generous to make the presentations and to, uh, as our featured uh, speakers today. But we also have at least two other folks who signed up to speak as registered speakers. And so we'll move to that part of our agenda now. Um, Craig, do you want to introduce our first I'm sure, I don't believe uh, the speakers are on the line. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, we, we uh, Tim Kehoe was here earlier, but, but I believe he dropped off. Okay. Well, um, I know that Mr. Kehoe, who uh, in particular, who is uh, at the ACNV Insurance Services, had specifically offered to assist. He he may have had to leave, and he um, put some comments in the chat about what he might be willing to do. Um, but we will certainly circle back with each of those individuals and invite them to provide um, you know, information to us offline, uh, which means that we're now at the part of our program where we are happy to hear from folks that may be uh, in the audience and who have a comment that they would like to make about their experience as small business owners or people that are looking at starting a small business and uh, wanna share their thoughts and views about the insurance market and what's available to them or questions that they have. I'm just place a note in the chat and I can move you over to, uh, to hear your comments. Okay, well, we have a quiet group today, but that is okay. So let me just take a minute then and um, ask if there's anyone who is at the MIA who has any final comments that they would like to make. Uh, Commissioner, I'll, I'll just, um, uh, for everybody's um, uh, information, just um, know that, um, and, and we've kind of put this out already today, but you know, we're here for you all as not only as business owners, but also as uh, individual citizens. So. Um, our, um, uh, all of our contact information is available on our website. Very easy to um, send us an inquiry or file a complaint if you've got a situation with your uh, uh, personal insurance. Um, the website that we have is a uh, 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 shameless plug for MIA's website. It's just got a ton of great information and we've got uh, the online capability for um, uh, citizens to 
uh, reach out with questions and file complaints uh, all by going to uh, the website. So just let you know that that's there. Absolutely. Thank you, Robert. I really appreciate that. And, I, and one thing that I want to underscore is we use the word citizen to mean person. So you don't actually have to technically be a citizen of anything in order to come to us for help. If you are in the state of, of Maryland or passing through the state of Maryland or connected to Maryland in any way, and you have a question about a Maryland insurance policy, we will be there for you. Absolutely. Thank you. But we get used to that term because it gets used a lot, but just want to make sure that people, for us, that's a very inclusive um, and open term. It really just means human being. <laughs> so, Definitely. Um, thank you. Yeah. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I really want to thank everybody who was with us today. I know that I have learned a lot. I have a lot of takeaways. Uh, it's really important that we understand realistically and, and the triple I and uh, the, Commer the chamber did a phenomenal job of helping us to identify what are the real challenges that business owners face as they're evaluating their insurance and their insurance options. But part of what we're here to do, and frankly, what that part of the business community that are financial advisors and brokers and producers is to find the pathway through those challenges that keep small businesses and entrepreneurs you know, on track and make sure that risk and risk management and risk finances, financing are not actual barriers to business. So we want to help you with that. I want to make sure that we have the resources that can help you with that because that's our governor's message, right? The Hogan administration is all about business. Maryland is open for business and the MIA is there to support small business with regard to their insurance questions and insurance education. And with that, I'm going to say thank you very much, and we will wrap this one up. Our materials are available on the website, and if you look in the chat, the, um, the link is there. So take care, everybody, and have a wonderful weekend.